Uh, let's pray as we get into the word of God this morning. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your word. I thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said a few minutes ago, today's title with Facing the Giants is What is Your Battle Plan? And I don't know about you, but um, I didn't have much of a battle plan going through life, and I'm like, whoa, or at least I didn't feel like I did. Um, and so now I'm much more conscious of it, wishing I had done more, had more battle plans about things in the past than I do now. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about this morning that life, going through life without a battle plan is like playing a video game. I watch my grandson play these video games, Star Wars, Legos, video games, and you know, all of a sudden some bad guy comes on the scene, you know, Darth Maul or, or um, Darth Vader, Kylo Ren or somebody, a stormtrooper, and they're gonna try to, you know, kill him with one of those um, blasters. And, uh, and he doesn't even know where they're coming from or anything like that. And he has no way really to prepare for it. When you're playing a video game, you have no way to prepare for what's gonna come and attack you. Isn't that right? But in life, you do. And that's what's life, to me, that's what life is like when we don't plan. Now, that doesn't mean that every time we plan something, that things go according to plans. I always tell that to brides, you know, brides get all caught up in the plans, the wedding plans. And if it doesn't go the way, you know, they get all uptight about, is it going to go the way I want it to? And I just tell them, you know, who cares how it turns out? The only thing that matters is that you're there and, and your, your fiancé is there and whoever is going to marry you is there. And it doesn't even matter if anybody else shows up. It doesn't matter how your dress looks. It doesn't matter if the flowers are wilted. It doesn't matter about anything else because your goal is to get married. Isn't that right? Amen. So sometimes we sweat the things that we shouldn't sweat about it. But um, it's important to have battle plans for different things. I, I was thinking, uh, it made me think about the hurricanes. You know, Pastor John and Marissa moved down to Florida, I think about 14 years ago. And that first uh, hurricane season that they were there, they experienced four hurricanes. Now, of course, they never had been through anything like that. But previous to that, Pastor Rob had taught in 1999 Y2K because um, you know, Disney was preparing for Y2K. The city of Chicago was preparing for Y2K. We knew people on both ends of those two things, and we thought, now, if these two big, you know, one government, one, you know, entertainment is putting so much money into Y2K, I don't think we should take this lightly. So Rob just began to teach people about how to prepare you know, have a little extra food stocked up, water stocked up. Maybe, you know, we live in a cold climate. Have something else that could be there to keep your house warm, um, whatever it is, lots of things like that. So Marissa had all these things that she'd gotten for Y2K, you know, um, different kind of lamps and uh, things that could heat up food and uh that could make water clean if they needed that and all of that kind of stuff. So that first season that they were down there for hurricane season, the Floridians were coming to her house to stay because none of them had ever even thought about preparing or being ready had a hurricane come. You know, that's why all of the shelves are all empty because people just aren't ready at all for anything lots of times. And it's important for us, if we're going to be ready for a battle, to do have some kind of preparation. Think about all the preparation that the Army goes through, the, all the armed forces, all the training that they go through, day in and day out, day in and day out. Some of those people that have been trained may never see a battle. But you know what? They're trained for a battle, aren't they? So they're prepared. When during war, I think about World War II, you, you see those old war movies and 
and the, you see the generals over this big map and they, they happen to know where this uh, enemy force is and this enemy force is and this enemy force. And so what do they do? They sit down and then they have a battle plan concerning how they're going to defeat the enemy in these different areas. They work together to defeat the enemy. Now, lots of times there are changes that have to take place in the plan because things are thrown in unexpectedly. Isn't that what happens with our life? Things happen unexpectedly. We didn't think were going to happen. And so then we have to change the plan that we've made. But the thing that's cool is it's important that we have a plan. I want to take a quote from Sun Tzu's uh, book, The Art of War. It says, victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. You know what that reminded me of? That reminded me of Joshua 1.8. Because Joshua 1.8 says, this book of the word shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you may observe to do, or another synonym for observe is to see, so that you see yourself doing according to all that's written in it. Then you make your way prosperous, and then you have good success. Do you see what happens there? That, that quote from Sun Tzu's said that first, warriors first win and then go to war. Where do you win first? You win first in here. Isn't that right? If you go into battle thinking you're going to lose, what's going to happen? You're going to lose. If you go into battle trying to figure out how you're going to win, you're going to lose because you don't have any plan about how you're going to go about winning. I started thinking about even, um, you know, when it comes to retirement age. A lot of people don't think about preparing for retirement until it's almost upon them, and then it makes it really difficult. But if you start planning for it when you're a lot younger, then you know what? It's just step by step. Now, there are things that can be thrown in there to put a kink in it, but at least there may be some preparation so that it isn't a mess when the time comes for it to happen. I was thinking about how, you know, there are a lot of people that want to get married, but they don't prepare for marriage. They aren't preparing themselves to be a better person. They aren't submitting to their parents because you have to submit to one another in a marriage. Uh, they aren't being loving when, you know, there is an opportunity to have a bad attitude. So they, they are training themselves. They think, well, when I get married, then I'll work on it. Well, it doesn't work that way. Because then you're building in a storm. Isn't that right? Or let's say you want to have children. Well, then go around, go be around some families. So you can see how do people do it? Read some books. All of that kind of stuff. What are you doing to prepare for the future? What are you believing and saying and all that? In Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, it, in, the, in the Living Bible, this is my favorite um, version of this verse. It says, any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Isn't that powerful? So it's built by what? Wise planning. When you say, well, I don't have an enterprise to build, you're an enterprise. You're building. You're constantly building your life every day. How are you building? How are you going from glory to glory and faith to faith? And you have to have, you have to think about, okay, here I am here. How do I want to get to here? What are the ways that I'm going to do it? You know, we were, Rob and I were talking yesterday in the car when I was taking him to the airport about going in the ministry. Now, how do you prepare for that? Well, you prepare by um, just spending time with God, getting into the Word of God, but you also prepare by serving. I mean, just getting down there and doing the nitty-gritty stuff that nobody else wants to do. Rob, clean toilets at our church. That's, I mean, 
we just we did we did the bus ministry um anything that we could find the stuff we did wasn't necessarily in front of people we were just available to do and we have plenty of people like that here at the church but we we just did that we were always available to serve and we studied god's word so if an opportunity arose for us to share um, whether it be one-on-one -on -one with somebody or in a group then it just flowed out because why out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and then it just keeps going um, in jeremiah 29 11 we can see that god has a plan for us god's a planner you know from the beginning of time you know right when adam and eve sinned he had a plan right away and you know sometimes those plans don't happen as quickly as we want i mean that plan of his has been going on for six thousand years is that wild he's a pretty patient guy isn't he and he had a great plan but in jeremiah 29 11 it says i know what i in the message i know what i'm doing i have it all planned out plans to take care of you not to abandon you plans to give you the future you hope for and the new international version says <clears throat> For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You know, I was one of those people that I didn't think too much about planning, setting goals, those kinds of things, um, just because I saw abuse with it. And so then I went to the other side and didn't do it the way that I should do it. Now, there were some things that I, that I did um, and that, I've, that I'm achieving even now or that I have achieved, but there was so much more that I could have done had I not <clears throat> been that way. Um, but God has plans for us, and we have to trust in the plan that God has for us. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is really helpful with that. It says, trust in the Lord um, from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. <coughs> your very bones will vibrate with life that's the message isn't that good it says there that listen for god's voice in everything you do don't try to figure it out on your own and then the new king i think it's new king james says trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths so you're looking for a plan the first thing in finding out a plan is going to god is saying lord What's the plan here? What do you want me to do in this situation? How should I handle this? Can you give me some steps? Because his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Sometimes we'll find the steps in the word of God. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will give us steps that will be in agreement with the word of God uh, in order because, I mean, it doesn't say buy a new house in the word of God, okay? but. Uh, he will direct our steps. Um, in Proverbs 21, 5, the New Living, it says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. And the message says, careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry puts you further behind. Now, don't be so inflexible that you can say, no, this is the plan, this is the way we have to do it. You know, sometimes... There has to be a detour. Sometimes there is a different road that you have to take because of a detour. Isn't that right? So we can't get so stringent about our plans that we're not open to a change of plan, okay? Because that can happen. What, ha what happens when we do that is we break. We're so inflexible that we break. Remember that the main plan is found in the Word of God. So I want to show you some bible game plans god's there are bible game plans all throughout the bible i just want to show you a few 
Could I have my other water? The thanks. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12. In verse 1, this is God's game plan with Abraham. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moriah. And the Canaanites were there then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed on still toward the south. The neat thing I like about this, I mean, God showed him where to go, didn't he? He gave him his game plan. He said, look, you're going you're gonna to need to leave where you are, and I want you to go over here. And here's the route you're going to take to get there, and this is who you're going to bring with you. But the neatest thing I think about this game plan is how old Abraham was. What was he? He was like 75 years old when Abraham got this game plan. So God's given us game plans all of our life. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. You know what's neat? Um, you know, Peter Daniels has Parkinson's, and he's had it for uh, a number of years. Now he hasn't traveled for, I don't know, um, to the United States for I don't know how many years now, maybe four or so, five, I don't know. But uh, he just wrote another book. Rob said it's his best book yet. Okay, so here's somebody that, you know, the medical field necessarily doesn't give a whole, whole lot of hope for, but he still has a plan. He still has goals for his life. He still sees purpose. He still is moving forward. My dad did that when he had his surgery last year, his heart surgery and his hip surgery. He knew God had a plan for him. And so what, what did he do? He did all his physical therapy and everything, and he's back, he's back working full time, and he ministers to people all the time because he knew that God had a plan for him, just like he has a plan for each one of us, and then we just walk it out. One plan isn't more important than another because every plan is important no matter what you think about it. Amen? And then in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, we see how God gave Joshua a plan. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its mighty warriors. Your entire army is to march around the city once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the horns, have all the people give a mighty shout, then the walls of the city will collapse and the people can charge straight into the city. Is that a wild plan or what? Sometimes God gives us a wild plan. We just can't believe that he really, you're really asking me to do this? And he, gave, he told them exactly what to do every step of the way in order to defeat his enemy. See, God gives us plans to defeat our enemy. That's Satan, isn't it? It, it says, you know, the word of God says, it's the foolishness of preaching that leads people to Christ. Isn't that right? And foolishness... Um, 
our God's wisdom looks like foolishness to the people that are out in the world. What the Israelites did there marching around Jericho, it looked pretty foolish, didn't it? Now, God doesn't ask everybody to do something foolish all the time, but there are plenty of times when he asks us to do something that is definitely out of the ordinary. But you know what? He gives us a plan on how to get the job done. He shows us the steps that we can take in order to defeat whatever giant that is in front of us, because we all have giants that we're facing. But he's going to show us step by step. No matter how big or how small the step is, take it. Move forward in defeating your enemy. Then let's look at 1 Samuel 30, verse 1. David went to the Lord for a plan. Three days, this is, um, let me give you a little bit background. Uh, David had been actually pretending he was working with the Philistines and fighting, and then um, the Amalekites came in, and they took all of David's family and all of his men's family and all of their things, and so here they get back from supposedly helping out the Philistines, and they find everything is gone. So all the men are crying, David's crying, and um, then David goes before the Lord, and God gives him a plan. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and had burned Ziklag to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Ahinoman of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in serious trouble, trouble because his men were very bitter about losing their wives and children, and they began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. One translation says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes that's what we just need to do, don't we? Because, man, something happened, it's not good, and we just need to dig down deep and encourage ourselves in the Lord. How do we do that? We dig into the word of God. We pray in the Holy Ghost. Jude 20 and 21 says, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God. I, I look at faces all around the room, and I, I know there are plenty of you that through times you're going through now, through times you've gone through in the past, that's what you've had to do. You've had to encourage yourself in the Lord, to stay close to him, to hold on in faith for as, as tight as you possibly could. And so David, that's what he did. He found his strength in the Lord. Then he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase them? Will I catch them? You see, he asked them, should I go ahead and do this? Because when he was younger, before he became, uh, no, not before he came, when he was younger, he, he went before the Lord and he said, Lord, um, you know, should I pursue and will I overtake? And the Lord told him, no, don't pursue them. You will not overtake them. Well, sometimes when you get an answer like that, you think, wait a second, how's that going to be defeating my enemy? Well, God knows the end from the beginning. Isn't that right? You know, Rob and I are going through a situation right now. Um, we had to move last year because of some situation uh, with the bank and our house, and it was it, the bank just really wasn't good. And um, anyway, so we rented a house <clears throat> that we're living in, and uh, we're going to have to move out by February 1st. That was the lease. The guy was selling the house, and we approached him and said, hey, uh, do you think we could rent this house? And because it wasn't selling, it was getting to be winter, and we thought, you know, at least he'd have tenants over the winter because you don't want to leave it empty. And so he said, okay, until 16-month lease, and then that'll be it. And Rob and I were, like, kind of hoping. We didn't put any faith in it or anything like that, that maybe we could stay until all of this 
worked out and we could buy another house again. And uh, even though, you know, there are a lot of things missing that we'd like in the house and everything like that, but it's a great house. It's a great house that we, uh, that the Lord gave us to rent. And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go look for a house. Here we've got the holiday season. I have to be out by February 1st, so I don't want to start looking January 1st, you know, because it doesn't give you a whole lot of time when you got to move a whole house. And, um, and then there's a whole lot, a lot of other things that are happening at the same time that I'm, I can't share. And so uh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I said to myself, I said to Rob yesterday, I said, well, you know what? God knows the end from the beginning about this. He knew when we moved into this house that we were going to have to move out. He has something better for us. And our steps are being ordered by him. Amen? And you see, you have to remember that even, I'd like to say, no matter how old you are, especially if you're a younger person, I want to encourage you that sometimes you're in a job and you think, man, what does this job have to do with my future? Or what does this... What does this class that I'm taking in school have to do with my future? Well, you don't know what that's shaping you for, for your future. Because your steps are ordered by God. He knew you were going to be there at that particular moment. And you may not like it, but you make the best of where you are on the way to where you're going because he has a plan. And he's going to work that plan out. It's up for us to listen and to find out what his plan is and to walk in it. Now, he might tell you all of a sudden, oh, got to change that plan, you know, because in my mind, I was hoping to have a plan of staying right where I'm at. Because, you know, it's not easy to move. Amen? I've moved a lot. I, if, you know what? I am a great packer. I'm a great mover. I've had lots of experience doing it. But you know what? I, it's not something I like to do. That is for sure. And then to do it a year after I did it, you got to be kidding me. But God's got a plan. Amen? And so my steps are ordered by him. I'm not going to uh, get despise the fact that I, I'm going to have to go ahead and move on. Anyway, so David uh, went to the Lord and said, should I chase them? Will I catch them? And the Lord said, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So David and his 600 men set out, and they soon came to Bezor Brook. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook, so David continued the pursuit with his 400 remaining troops. You know, sometimes you don't even have as many behind you to help you with your plan as you'd like to. Isn't that right? But you just keep moving forward with the plan. No matter how many people are for you, no matter how many people are against you, you just keep moving forward. And David did. He moved forward. He, he, got, uh, he got all the families back and all the stuff back and everything like that. Why? Because God showed him. And he even brought uh, a servant into his life that helped him. Sometimes God brings insignificant, what you might think are insignificant people, in, what you might think are insignificant situations, to bring about his plan in your life. So don't think that anything that happens is insignificant. It's not. That your steps are being ordered by him. Okay, let's go on to Gideon. In Judges chapter 7, um, uh, God gave Gideon a plan. This is, this is another really cool one. Um, it says, and they executed it. And um, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he thanked God. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up, for the Lord has given you the victory over the Midianites. He divided, he only had 300 men through a series of things. One of the ways that got rid of some of his men was he said, okay, I want you to take all the men down by the brook and um, I want you to observe which ones take the water and bring it up to their mouth and which ones kneel down into the water and lap it like a dog. And I want you to get rid of everyone that lapped it like a dog. Well, most of them lapped it like a dog and all he had were 300 left. So here he is. He only, he doesn't have 
as much to fight as he thought that he would. Were you ever in a situation like that? Maybe you didn't have enough money to fight something that you needed to fight, a battle that you, maybe you didn't have enough people, resources, whatever it is. Maybe you didn't have enough, but God, God is bigger than what you think you have. And so, here they are. He had his, he had his 300 men, and uh, he divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as my group blows the ram's horns, those of you on the other side of the camp blow your horns and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the outer edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, they blew the horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands and shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic shouting as they ran. When the 300 Israelites blew their horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not kid, killed fled to places as far as away as Beth Shitta near Zeria and to the border of Abel Mehola near Tabath. Then Gideon sent for the warriors of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh who joined in the chase after the fleeing of Midian. Gideon also sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim. Come down to attack the Midianites. Cut them off at the shallows of the Jordan River at Beth Barah. And the men of Ephraim did it as they were told. They captured Oreb and Zeb, the two Midianite generals, killing Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. And they continued to chase the Midianites afterward. The Israelites brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. Now remember that just a little bit before this, there's Gideon hiding because he's afraid of what's going to happen to him. And the Lord speaks to him and he says, why are you speaking to me? I am the least of the least. Did you ever feel like you were the least of the least? But God, he's got something for you. He's got a plan. And it's up to us to find out what that plan is and then to walk in his plan. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go there uh, in, the, in the scriptures, but in Exodus, we see how God gave Moses a plan to get Israel out of Egypt. He gave him the whole plan of how to get the Israelites out of Egypt. God's gonna give you a plan for your deliverance no matter what the situation that you're in, or for to help somebody else get delivered. Because God gave Mo Moses a plan to get himself and the Israelites delivered from Egypt. Then we've got Joseph. God gave Joseph a plan to feed the people, right? You might be wondering where your, your, your next mortgage payment is coming from. Or you might be wondering where your next meal is coming from. But you know what? God, but God, he has a plan, doesn't he? And just like he gave Joseph a plan to feed not just Egypt, but all of the surrounding area. Wow. How can he not? give us a plan to help the people that are around us. It may just be our family, but it, it may be our community, like with Marissa in the hurricane. She ended up helping a whole bunch of Floridians. Here she was, not even a native, never experienced a hurricane before. They didn't know what to do, but she had a plan that she got from the Lord, amen? So in order to win battles, it's not good enough to say you're trusting the Lord. A lot of people say, well, I'm just trusting the Lord. I'm just trusting the Lord. Well, yeah, then faith without works is dead. Amen? 
there's got to be actions that go along with it. Um, in Proverbs 24, 3, I read that already, but this is New King James Version. It says, through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Uh, in Proverbs 2, oops, where did I go? Proverbs 2.1, it says, My child, listen to me and treasure my instructions. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and understanding. Search for them as you would for lost money or hidden treasure. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of good sense to the godly. He is their shield, protecting those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of justice and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will know how to find the right course of action every time. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise planning will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. As we treasure God's word, what's going to happen? The right actions. He's going to show us what those right actions are to do in whatever situation that we find ourselves in. I started thinking about sports. You know, um, some of you are going to go home and watch a football game. Uh, and, uh, th but they, they didn't start their game plan today. They've been looking at videos of the team that they're going to um, play against, you know, for however long, I don't know, at least for this week. And they see how that team plays, and so they have a game plan against that team because some teams have different strengths than other teams, and so then with your game plan, you have to come against those strengths and, and uh, capitalize on the weaknesses of that enemy, isn't that right? But you have to know your enemy in order to do that. Well, we know our enemy, but sometimes we let him just put thoughts in our mind so that we just don't walk in the plan that God has for us, and then we don't walk in wisdom. Um, so we should have a plan. Think about it. If you want to lose weight, you have a plan on how to lose it and keep it off. You can't just have a plan to lose it. You have to have a plan to keep it off. Otherwise, you're in the same position. Isn't that right? That's the way it is in this battlefield of our mind. We have a plan. We're going to meditate on a particular scripture to get rid of the thought. But you know what? After that stops, we don't stop. We continue to have a maintenance program plan to keep us free from the thought that plagued us in the first place. Amen? Amen. We have a plan. We should have a plan on how to manage our money. We should have a plan on what we're going to do each day. Just a little. That doesn't mean that we have every minute of the day filled out, but we should have an idea. I know when <clears throat> I know what I want to accomplish during that day, then I can focus better um, and accomplish it. We should have a, a plan for what we're going to accomplish in a year. In Habakkuk 2.2, you've heard it many times. It says, write the vision and make it plain so that you can run with it. Amen? That he who reads it can run with it. Well, you're the one that should be reading it so that you can run with it. So here's some practical things. Just give me a few more minutes here. Here's some practical things that you can do um, to win the battle against the giants that you have. <clears throat> First off is to write it down. What's the plan? First off, you know, even before that, acknowledge your giant. What's a giant that you're facing? What's a giant that you want to destroy in your life? That you're going to go after line upon line. Not that you're going to go in there and beat it the first time that you do it, because that's not what happens. You're going to whittle away at that thing until it has no strength in your life. You just keep whittling away, whittling away, whittling away, until what? It crumbles in your life. 
and write it down. Break it down into tasks. How are you, how, how do you want to, how do you want to overcome this thing? You know, if it's a mind, it, it always is a mind battle. Um, so what scriptures are you going to use? Or what scripture are you going to use to beat this thing? That's what, man, I take one scripture and I use it and 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 use it going over, 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 over in my mind, over in my mind. It's just like somebody when they're uh, training for something. What do they do? They go through these routines over and over and over and over and over and over and over until they become second nature because that's how you win. That's how you beat it. You know, the, the, the uh, champions, people that are champions, teams that are champions, never stop doing the fundamentals. They always do the fundamentals. If they want to be a winning team, their fundamentals are always sharp. Because if your fundamentals are sharp, then when a situation comes up that's unplanned, not in the scheme of things, well, the foundation is sure. Isn't that right? And you can say, well, OK, let's go back to the foundation. And uh, let's just keep working from there. And you keep building then from there. And you can go up from there, even though everything else might have seemed like it crumbled above the foundation. But when your foundation is sure on the word of God, you, um, years ago when Pastor Rob started traveling, in my heart, and, and, and not that he's above this because he's not, nobody is, in my heart I knew that he wouldn't cheat on me. And I can tell you why I knew that. Not because he loved me, because I watched his relationship with God. He kept his foundations. He has all these years. He confesses the word. He prays. He reads his Bible. He acts on the word of God. And so it's because, I, you know, and he doesn't prance around and do it in front of me, but it's because I could see him in private. I could see him as he ministered to people, that there was no change, that his foundation was God and his word, and so on that. Now, if I began to see Rob go off, then the probability of him committing adultery would be much greater. Because when you get slack in any area, you won't be as strong to fight the opponent when the opponent faces you. Isn't that right? So that's why it's really important to keep your foundation strong. But in the natural realm, so you write down your plan, break it into tasks, understand the who, the you. Understand you, you know, if you're, you're weak in an area, well, you don't go and tempt yourself in that area. Isn't that right? You don't go. Rob did not go downtown for seven years after he got saved. Why? Because he knew he couldn't handle it. He knew that he'd probably just go down the tubes if he did that. So he didn't. Even now, I mean, we don't go, we only go when we, usually when we are with somebody else to go downtown. We don't usually just pick up and, hey, let's go downtown, kind of a thing. Just, um, just, that's just it. It's like somebody who used to go, somebody who used to go to um, bars a lot or clubs, you know, they don't, go there now because if they go there they know the chances of them falling in are much greater amen just whatever the weakness is um the why understand the why why are you doing what you do and understand when you're going to get the job done have those thoughts in your mind whether it's a natural giant that you're facing or whether it's a mental giant that you're facing, or whether it's a spiritual giant that you're facing. And review your plan often. Revise it. Look over it. You know, lots of times the January's coming up, and people write goals, and then they never look at those goals ever again. <clears throat> then the next, at the end of the year, they, they, they look at those goals, and they say, well, nothing got accomplished. Well, why? Because they didn't keep it 
in front of them. Assess your strength and your weaknesses. Know yourself and know your enemy. What are you going to be up against? And ask God to show you how can you overcome that. Understand that there are seasons and times for things. You know, somebody who's got uh, little children, uh, you know, I, I, I knew of somebody who had uh, seven children, four and under. That was back in the baby boom days. Can you, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and triplets. Now, do you think it was easy for her to keep her house clean? House cleaning was probably a giant for that lady, wouldn't you say? Yeah. But she had realized that she was going through a season. And that season was, that doesn't mean that her house shouldn't be clean. But it would be very difficult to try to keep it spotless having seven children, four and under. Isn't that right? Yeah. So she's going through a season. She could keep it the best that she possibly could and move forward from there. Understand the terrain you're going over. You know, if you, uh, again, Marissa Palladino, she likes doing road trips. And uh, so she leaves Florida. When they drive up here, they leave Florida like around 4 in the morning because she doesn't mind starting dark, but she doesn't want to end dark because it's unfamiliar territory, and you know the sun is coming up. But when you know the sun is going down, then you know it's going to be dark for a long period of time. So try to have knowledge of the terrain that you're going to be going through. Now, you know, when somebody, something hits you blindsided, you don't really know, but you can find out from people that have been there and done that. Amen? And you can glean what you can from them. Um, in order to win, I, I found these things online. So in order to win, you have to be in complete accord with your general. Who's your general? God is, right? So that means you're going to be in agreement with what the word of God has to say. In order to win your battle, you need to be disciplined. I mean, it takes discipline. I, again, I, you know, I love to use Pastor Rob and Pastor Nancy. You know, both of them were nuts. And both of them have been free from being nuts for 40 years, okay? Why? Or over 30 years for you. Why? Because they've been disciplined about putting the Word of God in, meditating on the Word of God, confessing the Word of God, because they know it would be really easy for them to go over to the other side. It is for all of us. When, once we all realize that, then we're able to move forward better. Set your priorities. Whoa. That is something I really have to work at because I get distracted. So I have, to, I have to really keep in front of me what's the priority here? What do I need to get done? Um, focus your energy and your resources on your priorities. Be strong. Work toward the goal. Make adjustments. I've talked about that. Um, be accountable. It's good to be accountable to someone or something. When, uh, you've heard me mention this before, but when the kids moved to Australia, I uh, had a really hard time in my mind. And, uh, you know, just, I mean, you went from feast to famine. I mean, here you got your kids around all the time, saw your grandkids all the time, everything. All of a sudden, you don't see them at all. <laughs> and it's hard to get a hold of because of the time zone difference and activities and all that kind of stuff. And so I was really going down the tubes. And so I called Carolyn Leaf, and I said, Carolyn, what do you have anything on rejection and grief? Now, we weren't rejected, um, but, you know, the devil tells you stuff like that, okay? Uh, they, they did what they thought they were supposed to do. I mean, what are you going to do? They're adults. You've got to let them do what they're supposed to do, right? Or they think they're supposed to do. Whether you agree with it or not, it doesn't matter. You've got to just do it. So uh, she said, oh, do my 21-day detox. Do it three times. 
and so I did, and I, it was neat because I did it online. You could have done it through the book, but I felt like I was more accountable every day. I watched this little video, and then every day I did what was uh, planned in the little thing. It only took me about 15 minutes a day, but um, it was a, it's a program to help you renew your mind in, in whatever area you need at the time. I did it the first 21 days, and I was like, okay, well, that was nice. Um, you know, it was, but I was still struggling. Then I did it the second 21 days, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm getting on top of this thing. This is good. Then I did it the third 21 days, and I was like, whoa, okay. And it was, I ended the third 21 days right at the time when we were going to go see the family for the first time in Australia. It was so good because I know I would have cried and cried while I was there because I would have just been thinking about that I wouldn't be able to see them again. I knew. And when, and I didn't, I didn't cry. I was so thankful that I could see them. I changed my perspective. And the day we were leaving, they were, you know, all in the car going to take us to the airport, and Roscoe looked really sad. I said, Roscoe, what's the matter? He said, Granny, I'm going to miss you. And I was like, oh! <laughs> there, everything in me said, don't you dare start crying. Don't do it. That would be the worst thing in the world you could do for this kid, for the family, everything. I, and God gave me a, man, it was a God thought. I said, Roscoe, when Granny goes home, she's going to make you a calendar, and it's going to have pictures from our trip on it, and then you can count off the days till we get to see each other again. And he got this big grin on his face, and so it, I, had I not done, had I not been accountable by doing that program, man, I'd have just been a basket place. It would have not been a good trip. But it turned out to be a great trip. And now every time I get to see the kids, I'm just thankful that I get to see the kids. Amen? Instead of thinking about, well, I don't have this, that, or the other thing. What's the giant that you're facing? We're going to pray right now. And I'm going to ask the Lord to give you a battle plan for just one of your giants. He's going to show you the steps that you need to take just step by step, line upon line, precept upon precept. It doesn't need to be this huge giant step. It just needs to be moving forward so that you're whittling away at that giant in your life. Amen? Amen. Father, Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you lead and guide us into all the truth and you show us things to come. I pray that you show each person a giant that they can work at beating with your help and that you give them the plan in order to see that giant defeated in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. Okay, go get him, tiger. <laughs> Hallelujah.